Okay. Um, hi, my name is Jasmine Roberts, um, and I'm an XR software engineer at Unity Labs. And so, Labs Group is the group that does a lot of the um, the precursor to research and development at Unity. And so, we have a um, XR team, a graphics team, a machine learning team as well. Um, and so, my talk is entitled "The Virtual Human Encoding the Human Operating System." So. Humans are very complex, and so encoding the virtual human is going to be a very daunting task for all of us. And so humans excel at some things, but then also aren't as good in other things. So meaning we only can process about 60 bits per second, but our memory actually is 2.5 petabytes, which is about 10, like 1024 terabytes, which means that we could actually store the entire internet within our brains. I know it's amazing, but we could do that. Um, Yeah, and so humans um, evolve very distinctly from other, other primates and animals. And so humans are distinctive because of a lot of things, and a lot of that was mentioned in the prior talk. So the first thing that actually makes us unique is our larynx and the voice box. Um, and then our brain obviously makes us unique in the complexity of the brain, um, our way that we interact with um, like our built environment. And then also we evolve from social, not necessarily individual intelligence like a lot of us would um, like to believe. So a lot of the way, the reason why we are the way that we are is because we have collaborative activities. And so one quote that I really like from um, John Steinbeck, who's one of my favorite authors, who says, man, unlike anything organic or inorganic, grows beyond his work. He walks up the stairs of his concepts and emerges ahead of his accomplishments. Um, and so what this is implying is that even though man's um, individuality is sovereign, at the same time, it's the collectivity of man that actually makes, that has like led to our evolution and has led to us being um, a species in general. And also one thing to note is that the human brain likes surprises, and so I'm gonna talk about that later, which is why that needs to be thought about when you encode virtual humans, because if you don't insert elements of surprises, you get the uncanny valley, and we don't want that. And so also, of course, we have ways of using our physical world to our advantage, which is tech and augmented reality, of course. A lot of virtual humans, so this is kind of a social commentary, but a lot of social, a lot of virtual humans are like female-based assistants. So if you think of whether or not they actually have an embodiment, so whether we're looking at Siri, Alexa, Cortana, a lot of them sort of have a, even though they're non-anthropomorphic in terms of like their voices and how they're conveyed, they're usually females. They usually, you know, kind of don't have like the voice is kind of like monotonous because it's sort of trying to convey something. Or conversely, like when we try to think of like building a virtual human, a lot of times they're like very attractive females. So what I did was I looked up like, you know, human, like, you know, what the perfect woman is. And of course, that doesn't exist. And so, you know, it's like, let's take elements of each of them. So it's like, she has Emma Watson's education. She has like Kim Kardashian's body. She has Myla Kunis's eyes. And she has Rihanna's like abs. I'm just like, uh, OK. <laughs> So I think that when we're encoding virtual humans, we should also be careful because some of these, some of our societal stuff could actually be just be reinforced when we're interacting with virtual humans. And so, and so this is a very uh, robust virtual human that we don't have yet. Joy, if you guys saw Blade Runner 2049. Um, and so basically, virtual humans will be extremely important because they're going to impact productivity, connectivity, and also just interaction in general. And a lot of companies right now can't say which ones, but a lot of companies right now are actually trying to use virtual humans as secre like secretarial assistants to you know, transmit information from, like, say, if I want to you know, talk to my friend in, say, he's in Sweden, and I can just have like, a secretary as a, as a middleman to go in between them. But then actually what I told these companies, which was sad that they had never thought of this before, I said, why can't you just have a representation of yourself? Because if you're the one who's submitting the information to um, your friend or your colleague, why can't you just have you? It's like we have 3D scanning technology, we have 3D modelers, it's like maybe, and again, there's a thing called the avatar dream where sometimes people don't like their physicality, and so if you see your physicality embodied, then you know, it's like objectifying yourself in a way. But that's important to consider that if you have like a, a person, a person, usually woman, going in between you and you know, the recipient, then actually you're just kind of reinforcing these sort of social dynamics that we kind of want to progress on. One way to do this, actually, there's some companies in, I think, Montreal and Vancouver, both, both sides of Canada that are doing this. And so they're also implementing um, genderless voices, if that makes sense. So basically, it just, it, when you hear the voice, it's like you don't associate with anything, it's just, basically 
just you, you wouldn't be able to associate it with anything. And I think that's important because it's just showing that when we have these agents, sometimes they don't have to be human. I know that it's my talk is called the virtual human, but actually, guess what? Sometimes humans aren't good at everything, right? Like we, we can only process 60 bits per second. And so also, if I need a task of doing something that humans aren't good at, like maybe lifting something that's like, you know, 30 times my body weight, like ants are better at that than humans. So I mean, if we're going to make some sort of like virtual or physical agent, why, ha why not have it embody some other biological species that's not us? And so just thinking about that and thinking about that not every sort of device that we make has to reflect us. Although even cognitively, even when something doesn't look like us, we still ascribe it to look like us anyway. But they don't actually have to embody us. And so if you want to make a virtual human, these are some technologies you can use. And some of these are quite recent. So if you want the, the Oculus Lip Sync SDK, you can download it. And I have a flash drive from them like that just has the SDK on it. And so it's very interesting. So they use Visim, so you can speak into the camera, and then and you could either speak into the camera or just or just you know put voice input. And it's for it's basically language agnostic. So any language you speak, it'll be able to you know somewhat robustly mimic the lips of like whatever you're saying. And then in terms of um, mixed reality capture, there's a lot of stuff going on. So that last one was actually at CES, but the top one is Microsoft's Mixed Reality um, Capture Studio, which is actually right across from Unity. It's a very interesting studio. And again, with Blade Runner 2049, the VR experience, those actors were actually scanned using the Microsoft Mixed Reality Studio. Um, and then at the bottom, again, that's kind of going based off of you, you should use yourself in a way if you're going to be collaborating in meetings. Um, so that's a scan um, of someone interacting and collaborating. And then, of course, at the Media Lab, there's another important component to this, which I don't think really gets introduced as often is the emotional aspect. Because these virtual humans, they need to be able to respond to human emotion. They need to be able to detect micro expressions. They need to be able to detect prosody. They need to be able to detect you know, just like syntax and just certain things that humans have. And so I mean, these are three different things. And also, mixed reality capture is very broad. And, but in terms of like the lip sync and affectiva, those are, pro those are the leaders in terms of emotional AI and um, like lip syncing AI, um, respectively. So I actually try to make a virtual human. And I was thinking, because like last year, I presented my thesis. And it was on a lot of times with virtual humans, we can actually use the virtual world to actually like internalize how we feel about ourselves. And so this was in, so on, in March, I went to um, Reutlingen. So I was at the IEEE VR conference. And I emailed, because the person's like, oh, we can do 4D scans at Max Planck. And so I emailed the person like, I want to scan, I want to scan, I want to scan, because she only did one person per group. Um, and so that's me at Max Planck, and then I just got like a scan, and I had to wear the white hat, of course, because like dark hair doesn't reflect light. And so she's like, "You need to wear like the lightest clothes you have." I'm like, "Come on, like I don't like everyone likes wearing black that I'm around, so that was a bit difficult for me." <laughs> I'm like, "You're lucky I packed that because usually I wouldn't have done that." Yeah, and so that was the result of it in the middle. I mean, although I kind of had to tidy it up, but. What's really impressive, though, is just like, so that's like the MTL, like the, the material file and the, the PNG. Like, that's very impressive. And that's actually the output of their scan. It actually almost broke my, my Google Drive. And a lot of things almost break my Google Drive. It's very heavy. Yeah, and so what I try to do, this is not the same model. This is a model I try to make myself. And actually, I would encourage you, if, is there, are there any artists in here? I'm sure there, yeah, there are artists in here. The thing is, it is scary. I swear, if you try to 3D model yourself, I felt like a narcissist. So I was like looking in the mirror. You have to. I was like looking in the mirror. I was like looking at the scan. And I was like, that's not my face. I'm like, darn, I don't really like that aspect of me. But I was like, that's how I look. So I can't really. And I mean, of course, it could be better. But I, this was like a one week exercise I did to just like try to model like just like an aspect of myself. And so what I used was just ZBrush. I mean, just a lot of the tools. Um, Photoshop, of course, to clean up some of the clothes, Oculus, and then, of course, Unity, because I have to use Unity. Um, and then so, and also, one thing I, I noted yesterday, I had to change this slide, which really worried me, but the IBM Watson SDK was great for conversational agents. Like a lot of demos that you see that are AR demos, they're powered by that IBM Watson SDK. Guess what? It's, it's deprecated as of like a few weeks ago. So if you didn't, but if you didn't get a chance to use it, I mean, you could still get it from a friend. You could probably find it on GitHub. But I, they're working on other technologies as well. And it's still like, they'll be fine in a few months. And it'll still be integrated again. But it won't be called the IBM Watson SDK. Um, but 
that was actually very useful and a lot of things that we've seen have used that. And then also Mixamo, so after you make a model, it's very easy to rig it with Mixamo in terms of like movement and movement and just like gestures. Um, but one thing that's actually very hard that I found is like blinking, right? Because a lot of these models that we see, they don't blink. And I feel like just blinking and like even twitching just little things that we do, that's become like increasingly important just to build sort of like you know, a, a knowledge of like I'm talking to a human. And so even like in rigging that, it was very actually uncomfortable to like go in Unity. I can show you guys um, the project if you want to see it, but like it's like weird to move your own arm around and like make your arm, like I'm not double jointed, <laughs> but like to move your arm around and make it like, you know, in, in such a position where like you're just rigging it so that I can do like interesting things. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my exploration into making like of, I guess, a virtual Jasmine, which was very interesting. And so the reason why I had the impetus for this, which I think is important, is there was a hackathon at Microsoft, the Microsoft Mixed Reality Capture Lab that was for like women that are in AI or XR. And so they had something called Miss Dewey. I'm not sure if you're familiar about it, but if you're not, look it up. So it was basically a, a search engine that had an actress, uh, Janina Gavinkar, and you could ask her a question and then she would respond to you, but there were like, I think like 240 something pre-recorded videos that she would respond to. Um, but then it, again, I think it closed in like maybe t uh, 2006. But it was just interesting to see that like, you know, just like what kind of like representation we can have in these virtual avatars, you know, just like we don't need, and I had to enforce to them, like I really don't think that we need, you know, a person that we don't know to like transmit information between the two, and so, I think, yeah, in like two weeks, I'm gonna uh, go up to Microsoft and talk to the HoloLens team about, you know, reconsidering virtual avatars and then also just, you know, just how to even get virtual avatars integrated into software, into like um, ed editing software like Unity or like Unreal or even just by yourself. So what I wanted to talk, uh, what I also wanted to talk about is right now, I think a lot of people are promising like the most robust and thought out virtual humans, but the thing is, as you can see, there's so many different pieces. It's almost like it's kind of making Frankenstein. Like to get a really good virtual human, it requires at least maybe 10 different types of software. So as I just to, re to rehash, so like, you know, to model, I mean, that's like ZBrush, Photoshop. I mean, you could use Blender if you wanted to, any sort of high um, like so software, like to converse IBM Watson, but then for now you're gonna have to find something else or just use a pre uh, project that you did previously. Um, like to actually get the lips to move, you'd use the Oculus SDK. Um, to actually like get the movement, you would use a, you could either rig it in Maya or use Mixamo. I mean, there's just a lot of different software. So basically what I'm saying is virtual humans are completely decentralized. So and I think that we need to consider that. And so perhaps you know, there will be one company that is able to sort of coalesce all of these sort of aspects to a human. But again, humans are complex. The internet is decentralized and that's fine. But the thing is, I don't know, humans necess like aren't necessarily, so I think that a lot of companies will need to collaborate and have a clear pipeline if we're gonna actually make these as robust as like we see in Blade Runner 2049. So that's it. Yeah. <laughs>